Ralph. Good morning, John. Read any good books lately? Well. Straight up, I'll never understand you geezers that sit around and read all day. If you were to get out and about, you'd meet more good stories Yes, than... I know, but this story is rather up your street. It's about an idiot who... <laughs> all right. Tell me about it on the way to the station, eh? Station? I'm not going to the station. Yeah, but, but I am. Look, give me a lift, will you? I'm in a hurry. All right. we stopped here for? Well, the story I was telling you about started in London about 80 years ago in just such a house as there. It was the office of a firm of solicitors called Gilkey and Green. Oh, just below the firm's neck. That's what I wanted. Very good, sir. No, no, no. Wait for me, please. You're certain. Do I have the pleasure of addressing Mr. Gilkey or Mr. Green? My dear young lady, Mr. Green was my grandfather's partner, but he burst a blood vessel in a fit of rage against Napoleon Bonaparte before I was born. Is it Mr. Gilkey, then? At your command, dear lady. Come. Now, will you have a seat? Now, what may I do for you, uh, Miss... Uh... I'm sorry, Mr. Gilkey, but I cannot tell you my name. Perhaps this will give you an idea of how much I'd value your help. Huh. I want you to help me to find a certain man. My dear young lady, I, I am a lawyer, not a detective. Oh, please help me, Mr. Gilkey. The man I'm trying to locate vanished 19 years ago. The last address at which he was known was number 18. Hmm? Livesey Lane, Soho. And the man's name? He was known as Stephen Swain. Stephen Swain. Stephen B. Swain. Yes. My dear young lady, the archives are full of cases where people have been swallowed up in this vast city, never to be heard of again. Oh, but this didn't happen to Mr. Swain. Surely you can find some record, some trace. And if I do, how shall I communicate with you? I shall call at your office exactly one week from today, at the same hour. Very well. <clears throat> Love me. <clears throat> I'm prepared to pay you as much again if you can give me any information. Yes. Goodbye, Mr. Gilkey. Good afternoon. Ah, 
And what might your pleasure be, sir? Uh, lovely cabbages. Uh, beautiful <laughs> onions. Oh, no, thank you. I'm trying to locate number 18, lives the lane. Number 18? Oh, it was burnt down in the fire. 15, 16 years ago. Where did it stand? It stood there. Over there. I see. Tell me, have you ever heard of a man named Stephen Swain in these parts? No. I see. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Good day. I beg your pardon. I wonder if I might ask your assistance. I'm trying to find a man who lived here once, or very near here. Stevens Wayne. Have you ever heard the name? Stevens Wayne. Does it mean anything to you? Have you ever heard of him? Seen him? Can't you tell me anything? I would prefer not. Very well, sir. I'm sorry to have troubled you. What did you say they call this? A typewriting machine. Machines. Here's one thing they'll never replace. A goose quill pen in the hands of an expert copyist. There'll be no improving on that with all their newfangled machinery. But you've been asking for an assistant, Nippers. I want a helper made out of flesh and blood, not made of lead and rubber and little iron wheels. <laughs> oh, it's you, is it? Well, have you decided to answer some of my questions? Well, I have come to you, Mr. Gilkey, in search of employment. What can you do? I am a copyist. A copyist, eh? Come into my office. Come on. Come and tell me something about yourself. Won't you sit down? No. Your name? Bartleby. Bartleby. Is that your first name or your last name? That is what you may call me, sir. Tell me, what made you wish to work for Gilkey and Green? You gave me your card. Notice the sign outside your door. In business on this location for over 100 years. I like that. I consider permanence a very great virtue. Yes, yeah, so do I, Bartleby. Well, as I'm in quite urgent need of a copyist, I'm willing to give you a trial. Can you be ready to start work tomorrow morning? May I start right away, sir? Ah, this is very nice, Bartleby. Very neat and very nice. Very good indeed. Watch out, nippers. Or the new man may overtake you in work. Mr. Gilkey, I'd like to proofread these titles with someone, but the new clerk, Mr. Bartleby, flatly refuses. Oh, well, we'll see about that. Mr. Bartleby, will you come in here, please? Bartleby! Yes. 
Am I to understand that you have refused to help examine certain copy with Mr. Nippers? I would prefer not. But every copyist is bound to help examine proofs, don't you know that? I would prefer not. Mr. Bartleby, if you want to remain in my employ, you must do as I direct you. I would prefer not. Then in that case, you're discharged from your position here. Well, don't you understand? You're sacked. You must leave the premises at once. I would prefer not. But this Bartleby must have been mad. Well, the way he was. But the mystery surrounding his past intrigued Gilkey, so he re-engaged him. Well, what was the answer to it all? Oh, the solution was at once so obvious and so simple that it never occurred to Gilkey until it was too late. Too late? <laughs> Well, my train. Please tell me the rest on the way, eh? Well, as I said, Bartleby was re-engaged and then Gilkey's troubles really began. Ah, oh, you're extremely punctual, I see. What did you find out about Stevens Way? Please. In one reference. From the archives of the Hall of Records, he was married on June the 18th, 1853, to Miss Clarissa McDowell. But then he does exist. He is living. I didn't say that. This marriage record was entered nearly 20 years ago. This proves that Stephen Swain was alive once. It does not mean that he's living today. But there's no record of his death. We can find him. Think how many people vanish in London every day. Once you have passed through that door, London can swallow you up in five minutes. How then can you expect me to find a man who's been hidden for 20 years? I'm foolish, I suppose, to expect the impossible. I'm sorry. Allow me. Bye, Mr. Gilkey. You have been most kind. Mr. Bartleby, what is the meaning of this? There's not so much as a single stroke of a pen on one of these pages. I have decided that I will do no more writing. What is your reason? My eyes. Look at my eyes. Yes, your eyes do seem rather bloodshot. Lighting's not very good in there. We must remedy that. Why don't you go to the country for the weekend? I have given up copying. What, even when your eyes get better? Yes. Well, in that case, Bartleby, I shall have no further use for you. I shall pay you your wages and you must go. I would prefer not. Prefer not, eh? I'd give him prefer if I were you, sir. Mr. Nippers, I would prefer if you would withdraw for I the present. I prefer to be left alone. Right now, I prefer that... Oh, good Lord, I'll leave you, sir. Mr. Bartleby, do I make myself clear? You are discharged. You must leave. I would prefer not. What earthly right have you to stay here? I order you to leave this office. I would prefer not. <laughs> Get over that desk, it's valuable. I know why we're moving our offices, Mr. Gilkey. Stay one place too long, Nippers, and you rot. New location, new clients. Oh, yes, that's all very well to say, Mr. Gilkey, but you and me, we know different, don't we? It's on account of him. Him? Mr. Bartleby. He won't leave you, so you're moving away from him. You would prefer not to leave, Mr. Bartleby? You must not leave, sir. Call them back. Replace the furniture. Let things be as they have been these hundred years. But why, Bartleby? There is too much motion in the world, sir. 
when people move, they become lost to each other and to themselves. Is that everything, sir? Just this desk and chair. Bartleby. Bartleby, where will you go? What will you do? Oh, Bartleby. Why are you what you are? I don't want his coat. It's no property of mine. Well, he was your employee. He worked for you. You return it to him. I wash my hands of the fella. It caused me trouble enough. What happened exactly? When you moved out of my building two weeks ago, this black Bartleby fellow refused to leave. When I told him to get off the premises, he said... He said he would prefer not... His very words, yes. Then he took to haunting the staircase, frightening the rest of the tenants. I had to bring charges against him. He's not in jail. Of course he's in jail. But Bartleby's done nothing wrong. Done nothing wrong? He's a trespasser, a vagrant, a common nuisance. The police found him asleep on the stairs, using this coat as a pillow. He left it behind him when they took him to Newgate. Oh, Bartleby. I leave the garment with you to dispose of as you see fit. Good day to you, Mr. Gilvey. Post Office, Department 49, attention, Mr. Bartleby. Miss Clarissa McDowell. Nippers, come in here. I want to put an advertisement in the papers. Could you direct me to department 49? Through the door, along the passage to the left, and down the stairs, sir. I see. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Sir? Can I help you? I'm trying to find out something about a man named Bartleby. Ah, Bartleby. He worked here? He worked here. What is this place? Can't you tell? Take a look around. This is the end of the line. The dead letter office. For more than 20 years, Bartleby's job was opening letters here in this room to see if the contents could identify the sender or the address each. <laughs> dead letters, sir. Doesn't that sound like dead men? Yes, it does indeed. The accumulated sorrow of the nation passes through this office. I wonder if you know anything about that. Ah. This is the one letter Bartleby himself wrote in all those years. And a long, long time afterward, this letter came back to him here, unopened, unanswered, like all the others. Thank you, sir. I read your advertisement and Mr. Nippers told me to find you here. Do you have news? I may have. Is he here in prison? Before I can answer that question, I must know your name. My name? There's Clarissa McDowell. Impossible. 
possible. I was named for my mother. My grandfather, on my mother's side, disapproved of her marriage with Stephen Swain. He was influential and the marriage was annulled. We moved to Canada, to England, and then on to India. I never saw my father. Just one more question. You mentioned Stephen B's way, and what did the B stand for? Bartleby. He's asleep. The silent man, we calls him. The doctor says he's dying. Bartleby. Hmm? Bartleby, I brought someone to see you. You're not... not. Clarissa, you look like her, but you're not. This is your daughter, Bartleby. I've come to help you. Please let me help you. Bartleby, there are new sciences, new doctors to help you. It's not too late. Do you hear me, Stephen Bartleby's Wayne? You can live. You must live. I... Uh, Listening to your story, I missed me train. <laughs> Mark you, it wasn't a bad yard. Well, I just about got time to tell you one. A modern one, though. Uh, sorry, hey, 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 who made me miss my train? As I was saying, I like modern stuff. And this story was told to me by a pal of mine. He's a sea captain. And a very strange story it is, too. Right to hear it? No. Right. As I was saying, this happened just Oh, a few days ago. And it started off in a station. A station just like this. There was a fella called H.T. Babcock. He had a lot of money. Warren was good for him. The 10.45 train for London King's Cross will leave from platform 6, calling at Berwick, Newcastle, York and King's Cross. Charles, I don't want to go. Don't get hysterical. Leave this to me, darling. I've got it all worked out. Come on. What are you doing in this train? Mr. Babcock, I've got some money for you. Have you? Here's all the money I have in the world. 280 pounds. I'm interested in 6,000. That's what you've stolen from me, Charles. I'll pay you back, Mr. Babcock, but, but give me time, sir. It's a temptation for a clerk who earns such a small salary to handle such large sums. Won't you trust me, sir? I did trust you. 
and you've corrupted the accounts. I've got all the evidence here. Now, get out with your pennies. Babcock, snack in the restaurant car, sir. Mr. Babcock. Thank you, lad. I'm no hungry. What happened? Get your things. We're getting off. Newcastle, Newcastle Station. The train now arriving at number two platform is the 715, the King's Cross London. Calling at York and King's Cross London only. Will all passengers for Sutherland, New Biggin and Hexham Change here. Didn't, Charles, you didn't. It was an accident. I didn't mean to hurt him. We've got to go to the police. No. I didn't kill him. He fell. Charles, what are we going to do? Leave this to me, darling. We'll have to leave the country. I'm so afraid. Please. Let's get to the cab rank. This isn't open yet. Please. We've got to get out of Newcastle as soon as possible. Well, come back at 8.30. No, please. I'll pay you. Uh, where do you want to go to? What's your first sailing? Well, the Lacaster's leaving today, but you don't want her. Where does she go to? What ports of call? None. It's 62 days to Hobart, Tasmania. Tasmania. Can we get a passage? Well, you won't be very comfortable on the Lacasta. Oh, we don't care. We just want to get away. You see, I have an opportunity of getting a vacation. My wife and I are... Well, this is a, a sort of an anniversary trip. The fare's 92 pounds, 10 shillings. Stateroom for two, Newcastle to Hobart. Uh, I can't take a check. The office isn't open. No, I've got the cash. Both British subjects? Uh, yes, both British subjects. Mr. and Mrs. H. T. Babcock. Uh, you surprised I knew the name? <laughs> I saw it on your briefcase.
We're passengers aboard the Lucasta. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Babcock. Yes, that's right. You're in stateroom A, up the gangplank to the right. Thanks. Come on. Uh, more baggage coming? No, this is all. Stolen the briefcase. You didn't have to kill him. He fell, I tell you. Look, Marie, everything's working out perfectly. We'll be on the high seas before they even find the body. Two months. No contact with the outside world. I tell you, it did. Uh, may I come in? I'm Captain Breen. Welcome aboard the Lucasta. <laughs> I. You know, she's a very old vessel. And coal is a highly inflammable cargo. Don't worry, Captain. Charles and I will be very careful. Charles? You are registered as Mr. and Mrs. H.T. Babcock. That's my nickname. Marie often calls me Charles. It's a nickname. <laughs> we should be quite an exclusive company during the next nine weeks. You see, you are my only passengers. I see. Mrs. Babcock, I trust that you and your husband will pay me the honor of dining with me in my quarters during our time together. Well, that's very kind of you, Captain. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, just one more question, Mr. Babcock. Do you play chess? Yes, a little. Good, good. I always find that the game of chess helps to relieve the monotony of these long crossings. Uh, good night. Good night, Captain. Good night, Captain. By the way, if you want to get rid of some papers, why don't you drop them over the side when we're out to sea? The fish do not read. He knows. I don't think so. Did you notice the way he looked at you when you were burning those papers? I leave the door open for so we could hear every word we said. How much do you think he heard before he came in the door? I don't know. I don't know. Let go for it! Charles, what are we going to do? Let go off! We've got to get off this ship. Nervous murderer, jittery wife, suspicious captain. It's quite a setup for a strange journey. What happened? Well, well, I've got to get going or I'll miss the next train. I <laughs> said, what happened? Well, everything was all right until they were three days out from Gibraltar. I'm afraid I'll have to say check, Mr. Babcock. And I think it's checkmate, I'm sorry to say. You play an excellent game, Captain. Oh, no, you're just out of practice. Anyhow, you lost the game some 20 moves ago when you exposed your king's castle. <laughs> I knew then you couldn't possibly win. One false move and everything's lost. Right, Mr. Babcock? Now, another game. No, really, Captain. Oh, it whiles away the time. Such a long voyage. There's something I've been curious to ask you about, Mr. Babcock. Yes, Captain? You booked passage with us at the 11th hour, so to speak. Is there anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong. It just seems a little odd. Why? Oh, that you should be in a last-minute rush and then catch the slowest cargo ship on the high seas to take you to Tasmania. Frankly, Captain, is it any business of yours? None whatsoever. How my wife and I travel is our concern, and our concern only. Oh, I didn't mean to be inquisitive. I'm sure you have your reasons. Now, shall we start? Excuse me. He knows. I'm sure he knows. Shut up. It's so funny. Three of us sitting in the captain's cabin, all of us pretending to be so pleasant and charming. And all the while he knows. He doesn't know anything. If he knew anything, he'd arrest us. He'd give us the run of the ship. Why not? We can't get away, can we? I've forgotten how to walk on the water. Yes, what do you want? Uh, Mr. Madison, I'd like to see you, sir. 
Tell him I'll be up on the bridge immediately. Where's the sound right, coming from? The ventilator. These old ships are full of tubes and pipes. If we can hear the captain, he can hear us. Everything we have said in here. Take care of those. Tonight. Did you drop something, Mr. Babcock? I was just getting rid of some old... Don't have to explain to me. I just hate to see you lose what little luggage you've got. Saw me drop the briefcase overboard. He's going to tell the captain. What are we going to do? Well, I've got to find out how much they know. It's an excellent dinner, Captain. Yes, I'm rather proud of our chef. It isn't easy to set an attractive table when you've been out to sea for a few weeks, completely cut off from the rest of the world. Not completely, surely. What? I mean, you, you have a radio. You get the news? Oh, yes. More cake? No, no thanks. thanks. Well, if you don't mind, I think I'll have another slice. What news do you hear from home? What sort of news? Sport? Politics? I thought maybe some news of crime, that sort of thing. Oh, yes, sometimes. Oh, certain I can't interest you in this cake. It's absolutely delicious. Yes, I did hear something on the BBC last night that struck me as a bit odd. It was about a man with the same name as you, Babcock. Really? Isn't yes, the funny thing is he had the same initials, H.T. <laughs> it all happened on a train or somewhere. More coffee? What about this Babcock? Oh, I didn't listen very carefully. Just caught the name. Relative of yours? How should I know? Did they find the murderer? Can't exactly recall. Anyhow, it's no concern of ours. Chess, Mr. Babcock? Say? Shh. Radio operator. Yes, sir. We'll be putting into Gibraltar first thing in the morning. Gibraltar? I want you to radio ahead. Have the authorities ready to come aboard as soon as possible. Tell them it's a desperate matter. I want the responsibility off my hands. Yes, sir. He dies or we do. But darling, there isn't a chance. I'll figure a way. But what good? 
What will it do? How many people know he's already sent the radio message? I'll think of something. Something. Alongside. Yes. Mr. Babcock. I must ask you and Mrs. Babcock not to leave your cabin. We have an emergency call at Gibraltar. Chess, Captain. Chess? You win, as usual. Checkmate. I don't understand, Mr. Babcock. I'm not Babcock, you know that. I murdered Babcock on the Flying Scotsman out of Edinburgh. You murdered? You're under arrest. Take these people into custody. Come now, Captain. All these weeks we've been your honored guests. I didn't know. You radioed ahead to the authorities. Yes, the medical authorities. I just found out there's typhus aboard. I saw no reason to worry you. You never suspected? I never suspected that you were anything but passengers aboard my ship. Officer, take them ashore. Now, I've missed the third train. Well, why worry? It's a good story. Let's go and have a drink. Come on. 